The scaphoid is described as an S-shaped bone that twists along its longitudinal axis. It is the largest and most lateral carpal bone in the proximal row and forms the floor of the anatomical snuff box. It is unique in that it is the only bone that crosses both carpal rows, meaning it links the proximal and distal carpal rows. It articulates with five bones, the radius proximally, the lunate medially, the capitate distal medially, and distally with the trapezoid and the trapezium. And because it articulates with four of the remaining seven carpal bones, it moves in nearly all wrist motions. So you can imagine that any damage to its articular surface can lead to morbidity of the entire carpus, and it's divided into four regions. The proximal pole, the waist, the distal pole, and the tubercle. So how do you tell if you have a left or right scaphoid? A really easy method is to find a large concave surface, and this is for the capitate. This will be the largest and most concave surface of the scaphoid. So you find that and you have it pointing directly towards you or you're looking directly at it. And the medial surface for the lunate will be pointing down. So again, look directly at the capitate surface, have the medial surface for the lunate pointing down, and the direction the tubercle is facing will tell you which bone you have. So in this case, the tubercle is pointing left so you know this is a left specimen. I should clarify that in this video, this is a right scaphoid, and this specimen is a left scaphoid. The proximal pole consists of two articulations, one for the radius and another for the lunate. The articular surface for the radius is located proximally and is convex, and the articular surface for the lunate is located medial and is flat and semilunar, or crescent-shaped. The scaphoid is anchored to the lunate via the scaphoid lunate interosseous ligament, or the SLIL. The distal pole also consists of two articular surfaces. One of these surfaces is concave and is for the capitate, and the other articular surface is convex shaped. And this articular surface sometimes has a ridge that divides it into two facets, and this forms your scaphoid trapezial trapezoid, or STT joint. The facet for the trapezium is on the radial volar side and the facet for the trapezoid is on the ulnar dorsal side. The tubercle is located at the ventral surface adjacent to the capitate fossa at the lateral aspect of the distal pole. It is mainly non-articular and serves as the attachment site for several soft tissue structures such as the STT ligament, flexor retinaculum, flexor carpi radialis tendon sheath, and a small portion of the abductor pollicis brevis. It's also important to know that the tubercle is one of two major sites where blood enters the scaphoid. The waist is a central region. It contains one or more oblique ridges, or crests. I say one or more because this is a variable trait, meaning some people have one, and some people will have two or more. And these ridges lie on the dorsum, between the articular surfaces of the radius proximally and the trapezoid and trapezium distally, and they serve as the attachment site for ligaments and the joint capsule. Also, it's very important to know that these ridges contain numerous foramina that allow entry for blood vessels. The majority of the blood supply to the scaphoid enters through these ridges. I would like to spend a few minutes talking about the blood supply to the scaphoid. But before I do, I will review some important concepts. The first concept is how a bone receives blood supply. Blood supply to a bone usually enters where ligaments and tendons attach, and through foramina, which are small little holes where nutrient vessels can enter. Another important concept is that articular surfaces do not allow for nutrient vessels to enter, and they are not sites for attachments of ligaments or tendons. Therefore, the more articular surface a bone has, the less blood supply it will receive. And the less blood supply a bone receives, the greater the risk that bone has to undergo an AVN or avascular necrosis or a non-union after a fracture. A great example is a talus bone in the foot. About 70 to 80 percent of the talus is covered in articular cartilage. It articulates with the tibia and fibula superiorly forming the ankle joint. 
with the navicular anteriorly forming the talonavicular joint and inferiorly with the calcaneus forming the subtalar joint. Also, the talus has no tendinous attachments, so talar fractures are very prone to undergoing an AVN. The scaphoid is very similar to the talus in that sense. About 70 to 80 percent of the scaphoid is covered in articular cartilage. As we mentioned earlier, it articulates with five bones. And the scaphoid has no significant tendinous attachment. I say significant because although a few fibers of the abductor pollicis brevis attaches to the tubercle, this attachment is by no means a major source of blood supply. The blood supply to the scaphoid enters from two major areas, the dorsal ridges on the waist, and to a lesser degree, the tubercle. And the main blood supply comes from branches of the radial artery. In terms of regions, the blood supply is best in the distal third and the waist and porous in the proximal third. The reason is that the distal pole has a direct blood supply via the tubercle, and the waist has a direct blood supply via the dorsal ridges. The proximal pole has no direct blood supply because it's almost completely covered by articular cartilage. So how does the proximal pole receive its blood? Blood enters the proximal pole via a retrograde flow. About 80% of the vascularity of the entire proximal pole is supplied by vessels that enter from the dorsal ridges. And the remaining 20% comes from vessels that enter the tubercle. Another way to think about this is that the scaphoid has an extraosseous and intraosseous blood supply. The distal third and the waist have an extraosseous blood supply and the proximal pole has to rely on an intraosseous blood supply that enters it from the retrograde flow. This is why fractures of the proximal pole have the worst prognosis. A condition you may come across is Prizer's disease, which is an AVN or avascular necrosis of the proximal pole. If you go through the literature, there is a discrepancy as to whether Prizer's disease is caused by trauma or if it's truly an idiopathic condition. Also, the scaphoid is the most commonly fractured carpal bone, and the most common site of fracture is the waist. However, scaphoid fractures tend to be rare in the elderly and children because during a fall on an outstretched hand, the distal epiphysis of the radius will fail before the scaphoid. Similarly, in the elderly, especially those with osteoporosis, the distal radius will fail before the scaphoid.